Welcome back to Hungry for History. Recently, my husband and I made a trip to a local bison farm to purchase some bison meat. I've never tried bison meat before, so I have looked forward to today's pemmican recipe for a while. Today, I will specially make bison pemmican, which is survival food invented by Native Americans in North America. Let's get it started! <laughs> So what is pemmican? Pemmican is a high energy, high calorie, but low volume food. It is primarily made with dried lean meat that is ground and mixed with reindeer animal fat and bone marrow. Occasionally, pemmican is made with dried berries like Saskatoon berries and cranberries. It was often tightly packed into leather bags for use when hunting or riding. The fat helps preserve the food by sealing the meat from the air. Because of the sealing qualities of the melted fat and marrow, pemmican stays fresh for long periods of time. The word pemmican comes from the indigenous language Cree name for the food, pemmican, which literally means make grace. But not all Native American tribes refer to it as pemmican. For example, the Lakota people of Dakotas call it wasna. Pemmican was mostly made from bison, but also made with other meats, including deer, moose, elk, or salmon. Bison, also known as the American Buffalo, is the national mammal of the United States according to a law signed by former President Obama in 2016. Bison populated the North American continent long before people settled here. At the beginning of the 19th century, bison's territory once stretched from the forests of Alaska to the grassland of Mexico. No one really knows exactly how many buffaloes there once were. Historical accounts gave us some guidance. In the late 18th century, Peter Federer, who was a British surveyor, remarked it at the vast herds of bison he saw in the Canadian plains. He said, quote, from the north to the south, the ground is entirely covered by them, appears quite black. I never saw such amazing numbers together before. I'm sure there were some millions inside, as no ground could be seen for them in that complete semicircle, extending at least 10 miles, unquote. When Meriwether Lewis and William Clark traveled through Montana in 1804, they reported that they often saw thousands of buffaloes at one view. Native Americans had been hunting the bison for some 12,000 years. Plains Indian tribes that lived on the vast grasslands between the Mississippi River and the Rocky Mountains in today's United States and Canada relied on the bison for everything from food and clothing to shelter and religious worship. They used almost every part of the animal. They ate bison meat, sold cloth, bags and tents from bison skin and sinews, made tools from bison horns and bones, and they used dried bison manure as fire fuel. Before the acquisition of horses, Plains Indians hunted bison on food. There were two primary hunting methods used by the Plains Indians to catch a large number of bison at one time. One was a bison jump. A bison jump requires luring a herd of bison over a cliff, causing them to fall to their death. In order to drive the bison to the jump site, some hunters would put on the hide of bison calves as a decoy to attract the attention of a herd of bison. Then they would imitate the distress call of bison calves to urge the bison herd to follow them. Some other hunters would wear wolf pelts imitating threatening wolf's howl, following the herd to drive them forward. As those hunters ran close enough to the cliff, they would jump out of the path of the unrushing bison at the last possible moment, but the bison would be running too fast to stop and fell off the cliff to death. The other hunting method was similar to the bison jump. Instead of driving the bison herd into a cliff, the bison were driven into a timber corral. Hunters would hide in an area behind the corral, usually just over the brow of a hill, invisible to the bison. Once the bison got into the corral, they would be killed by bows and arrows. By using those two communal hunting methods, hunters could get not only dozens, sometimes even hundreds of bison in one hunt. They often produce a vast amount of meat that would be enough to share among tribe members and extra for trade. 
Native American women played a significant role in pemmican making. While men were likely the major labor in bison hunting, women were responsible for preparing dry meats, fats, and cutting up bison skin for making pemmican bags. Women offered butchery scales to slice meat into thin strips that were spread out on wooden racks to be smoked or dried by the sun. They also helped to collect choke, Saskatoon, and other berries in season to add to pemmican. Pemmican was very versatile and could be eaten raw like an energy bar. Native Americans also cook up pemmican into a soup or stew called rababu. My pemmican recipe is based on the historic account of Paul King, who was an Irish Canadian artist. King traveled through the Canadian Northwest twice in the 1840s. On both trips, he painted the lives of indigenous people. In 1859, he had his travel journals published in the book Wanderings of an Artist Among the Indians of North America from Canada to Vancouver's Island and Oregon through the Hudson's Bay Company's territory and back again. This is probably the longest book title I have ever read. In the book, Ken described the process of making what he called pemmican. Quote, the thin slices of dried meat are pounded between two stones until the fibers separate. About 50 pounds of this are put into a bag of buffalo skin with about 40 pounds of melted fat and mixed together while hot and sewed up forming a hard and compact mass, hence its name in the Korean language, pemi, signify meat and calm fat. Each car brings home 10 of those bags and all that the half breeds do not require for themselves is eagerly bought by the company for the purpose of sending to the more distant posts where food is scarce. One pound of this is considered equal to four pounds of ordinary meat, and the pemmican keeps for years perfectly good exposed to any weather." Unquote. According to Ken's description, the pemmican was only made with lean meat and fat. The ratio was 50 pounds lean meat to 40 pounds melted fat. For my recipe, I used about one pound lean bison meat. As for fat, I bought a bottle of beef tallow. I was not able to get bison fat this time since the local farm does not sell fat separately. So I decided to use beef fat as substitute. To make my pemmican recipe, you need one pound of bison meat, which when dried can produce five ounces of dry meat and four ounces of liquid fat. Step one, slice bison meat into thin strips. When trying to cut thin slices, it's easier if you put the meat into the freezer for 30 minutes to an hour before cutting to partially freeze it. This helps firm up the meat, making it easier to slice. Step two, dehydrate the meat until brittle. I use a dehydrator to dry the meat. If you don't have one, you can dry your meat in an oven. Place meat slices on the dehydrator trays and dry at 160 degrees Fahrenheit for 12 hours. Step three, add the dried meat to a blender and blend the meat until it's almost a powder. Transfer the ground meat into a large mixing bowl. Step four, scoop out four ounces of beef tallow. Add the tallow to a sauce pot over low heat. Stir gently until the fat melts and becomes translucent. Step five, add the melted fat into the ground meat. Mix until the meat and the fat are well combined. Step six, pour the mixture into a baking pan and pat it down. And wait until the pemmican cools down before you cut it into chunks. While waiting for the pemmican to cool down, I want to talk to you about the war that was started over pemmican in the early 19th century Canada. Let's review the quote from Paul King's book again. Quote, each car brings home tens of those bags and all that the half-breeds do not require for themselves is eagerly bought by the company for the purpose of sending to the more distant posts where food is scarce. Unquote. King points out that the pemmican was made by half-breeds who brought home what they needed and sold the rest to the company. Here, half-breeds refer to descendants of European fur traders and native women. The company refers to the Hudson Bay Company, which was a fur trading company established by two Frenchmen in the 1660s. In the 17th century, the fur trade emerged as a major commercial enterprise in North America due to the high demand for beaver felt top hats in Europe. 
The British King Charles II granted the HBC a vast area that included all the land draining into Hudson Bay in today's Canada, of course without consulting the native people who had already resided there. The HBC built coastal trading posts located at the mouth of major rivers flowing into the Hudson Bay. Native traders had to travel to those trading posts to barter first for European goods such as metal tools, guns, textiles, and so on. The HBC wasn't the only company searching for profits in the fur trading business. Its biggest rival in the early 19th century was the Montreal-based Northwestern Company, NWC, which was formed in 1779. Instead of waiting for native traders to come to the posts, the NWC took a proactive approach to the trade, sending out voyagers who traveled westwards by canoes and tapped into new territories for fur. Those voyagers were among the first Europeans who adopted pemmican. In the beginning, they relied on a meager ration including leached corn, dried peas, biscuits, lard, and alcohol. But as they burned thousands of calories a day paddling canoes and crossing portages, they realized that the protein deficit diet would not sustain their westward expansion, and they needed an adequate source of energy. According to historian George Coppitz, this need was met by pemmican. Pemmican contained between 3,200 and 3,500 calories per pound and at most double the energy provided by dry corn. We know that for thousands of years, native populations had supported themselves by producing pemmican. The natives also had a common custom of giving away surplus pemmican to those in need, but the fur trade changed the trade in pemmican enormously. Fur trade companies compete to win the business of local native people. In order to secure supplies, they showered their indigenous suppliers with presents, gave them more favorable rates of exchanges, and married into tribal families. Since native women have the knowledge and skills of making pemmican, trade posts hire many of them to produce pemmican under factory-like conditions. The HBC and the NWC contested for key trading routes and provisions reached at all-time high in the Red River colony. In 1810, Thomas Douglas, 5th Earl of Selkirk and a major shareholder in the HBC, persuaded the company to establish an agriculture colony in the Red River Valley and populate the territory with destitute people from Scotland and Ireland on June 12, 1811. The HBC gave Selkirk a land grant of 116,000 square miles, commonly known as the Red River Colony. It covered portions of present-day southern Manitoba, northern Minnesota, and North Dakota. It contained the outposts belonging to the NWC and the HBC. At that time, the region was mainly populated by groups of the First Nation and the Métis people. The Métis were the descendants of French fur traders and indigenous women. They were active participants in fur trade bison hunt and the pemmican production. Instead of driving bison off cliffs or into closures, the Métis used horses and firearms. The NWC had a close relationship with the Métis who supplied a large percentage of the NWC's pemmican. Selkirk hired Miles McDonough as the first governor of the Red River Colony and sent about 300 people from 1812 to 1814. However, the settlers had difficulty sustaining themselves as drought, flood, and grasshoppers caused the crop failure. They relied on provisions from the HBC. On January 8, 1814, Miles McDonough, the governor of the colony, issued the Pemmican Proclamation that forbade the export of any food supplies, including pemmican, from the Red River colony for a year. In October, McDonough ordered the NWC to shut down all of their outposts in the Red River colony. The HBC could rely on provisions from London and many forts in the Bay Area, but the NWC had to rely on the Métis and the First Nation people. The declaration angered the NWC traders and many Métis who saw the move as a direct sanction against them. With the proclamation, it was illegal for the NWC to trade with the Métis for pemmican and other foodstuffs in the Red River colony. The NWC believed that this was the HBC's ploy to undercut their operation, but the NWC disregarded the proclamation and continued to operate in the Red River colony. As a result, the HBC enforced the order and seized hundreds of bags of the NWC's pemmican. The NWC also tried to persuade the Métis to join their resistance. 
They reminded the Métis because of their mother's heritage, they had a birthright to the Red River colony and Selkirk had no right to take it away from them. In July 1815, Governor MacDonald banned the hunting of buffalo on horses near the settlement to prevent Métis from stampeding the herd's outreach of settlers. The ban further antagonized the Métis, which drove them to stand behind the NWC in the Pemmican Wars. Of course, the Métis ignored the order. In the following year, there were a series of minor skirmishes between the two opposing groups. Selkirk raised an army to defend his colony and ordered to confiscate foodstuffs, weapons, and any other supplies from the NWC. The NWC retaliated by robbing, destroying, and kidnapping HBC properties and personnel. In the summer of 1816, minor skirmishes eventually escalated into bloodshed. On June 9, 1816, a battle broke out at a place called the Seven Oaks, also known to the Métis as the Fort Plain, located in modern-day Winnipeg. An NWC detachment of about 16 Métis and First Nation people, led by a man named Gathbert Grant, was on its way to the northwest Fort Gibraltar to deliver provisions. They encountered a group of 28 men led by Robert Semple, the newly appointed governor of Red River Colony at Seven Oaks. Though the two parties engaged in a fierce verbal argument, neither was looking for a solution in a firefight. However, things got heated up quickly and a shot was fired by one of Simple's men. The battle lasted about 25 minutes and resulted in 21 deaths of the HBC party, including Governor Simple and only one death at the NWC party. The Seven Oaks battle did not end the conflict between the NWC and the HBC. Skirmishes continued between forces loyal to the HBC and the NWC for another five years to the detriment of both companies. In 1821, under the pressure of the British government, hostility ended with the merger of the two rival companies under the name of Hudson's Bay Company. By then, the HBC had a monopoly on the fur trade in the British North America and survived well in the 21st century. That's all I have for you for the history part. It's time to taste the pemmican. Do you want to grab a bite? Yes. This is really different from any beef jerky or protein bars that I have ever had. And there is no seasoning at all. And I find it's challenging to describe the flavor. Um, what do you think? I think that what stands out to me the most is the texture. Mm -hmm. It's very smooth for the most part, but occasionally has some of the crunchy meat fibers from the dried uh, bison. And then because there are no spices to really yeah. bring out, you know, different notes of flavor, other than you've got this really mild beef flavor coming from the tallow, and then this really nice. Uh, more bold bison flavor that stands out to me. I think it will taste way better if I add some seasoning like salt and pepper. If I was one of the first traders who was canoeing down a river, yeah for sure if there was like nothing else to eat this would be the perfect survival food. For me if I was canoeing down a river even if I had other stuff to eat I would probably go for this just because this is hearty and it tastes good. I like the bison beef flavor. It was difficult for me to tell the difference between bison and beef. And I guess because I enjoy beef so much that I've just been able to tell the difference between the bison and the beef. The bison has a little bit more of a gamey flavor, but it's not gamey in the sense that deer is or venison if you're used to that. So. In the next episode, I'm going to give you an example of how to use the pemmican in a soup like the Native Americans have done. And if you liked uh, today's video and would like to show your support, please give us a thumbs up, subscribe, or share it with your friends. We'd really appreciate it. Thank you for watching today's video. I hope you have a great day. Bye-bye.